Hello everyone and welcome to today's HH Barnum webinar, Is IOLink Right For You? My name is Cody Dawson and before we get started, let me express our sincere thank you for taking a moment to be with us here today. We'll be answering some common IOLink questions at the end of today's presentation, but feel free to ask any specific questions by using the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If we aren't able to answer your question by the end of the session, We'll be sure to follow up personally afterwards. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar will soon be uploaded to the Barnum website. All right, let's dive in. IOLink, you've heard the buzz, you've read articles about IOLink and Industry 4.0, but what exactly is IOLink? In this webinar, we take a moment to answer that question. We also discuss why IOLink is becoming so popular, we compare parallel versus network versus IOLink wiring architecture and evaluate Barnum's revolutionary IOLink cost savings calculator. To help us learn about IOLink today, we welcome two of HH Barnum's finest experts in the field of automation, John Wilson and Zach Attila. Zach, John, let's get started. Thanks, Cody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning into this presentation. My name is John Wilson. And I'm Zach Cotella. So today we are going to discuss the topic of IOLink and does it make sense for you? And Zach, uh, like you, I, I get to work with many people involved in industrial automation, people like designers, pro um, project estimators, and even business owners who have a ton of pressure to make their equipment better and less expensive. Um, so to combat this pressure, I know that many people have been asking questions on how incorporating IOLink into their control systems architecture can help them gain more system capabilities while also reducing costs. So <clears throat> we wanted to create a presentation that will help our customers understand these advantages of utilizing IOLink by comparing an IOLink system layout to some of their more uh, conventional system layouts. So Zach, I know that you have helped many of your customers understand the benefit of IOLink. In fact, you created a simple tool or a calculator that helps your customers understand these benefits. Why don't you tell me about this tool? Yeah, we created an IOLink worksheet where we're able to do an analysis of a customer's um, IOLink network or IO network requirements, that being discrete IO, analog, traceability products such as RFID, um, motion such as pneumatic motion, um, and outputs, and, and do an analysis of that in a conventional parallel wired model, a conventional network model such as Ethernet, IP, or Propionet and then comparing that to IOLink to see really what the general benefit, not only from a hardware cost savings is, but an overall network performance and advantage point that, that can bring to the table. Yeah, this is great. I, I've seen uh, some of your comparisons in the past and the savings can really be quite significant. So, hey, let's get started um, on these comparisons, but before we do, I wanna take a minute to uh, just briefly define IOLink and its advantages. Sure. All right, so what is, uh, what is IOLink? So as it says there, IOLink simply is an industrial communication protocol that simplifies control systems through design, layout, and functionality. Um, so simply extending your current network protocol to easily manage and monitor status of all your IO in the field. Um, and there's a couple of key factors that play into why IO Link is advantageous for that. One of the, uh, the factors is that it is field bus independent, um, meaning IO Link is working in conjunction with your upper level network, uh, such as uh, Ethernet IP or Profinet and, and various industrial protocols at that. Um, so it can work with any upper level protocol that you have. All right, so not a field bus, um, but it's an extension of your current field bus. Absolutely, that's a great simplistic way to put it. It's simply an extension through connectivity of uh, bringing your IO-Link devices to the network. What, what makes IO-Link so different? Is, uh, I see a point-to-point -point communication. Explain yeah, it. I mean, strictly it is, again, what it says, point-to-point -point communication with the ability to um, simplify the control, um, monitoring, and status of all your IO-Link traceability devices on your network system. And I understand uh, IOLink uses standard M12 and M8 connectors and yeah, there's standard nothing, media. Yeah, there's nothing unique or proprietary about it. It's universally compatible. Um, all the major automation manufacturers in the world uh, are pursuing 
development of IO-Link products. Um, and the fact that that's done so just opens up the, the opportunities for the customer integrator to, to utilize the advantages of IO-Link to its maximum. And yeah, we've both seen IO-Link's um, popularity grow rapidly. So and I think that has a lot to do with uh, the fact that it's so uh, compatible and there's many more devices being made each day. Absolutely, as of last year, it actually overtook Ethernet IP and Profinet in terms of the number of addresses out in the field in the industrial market. Oh, that's awesome. So let's go through some advantages. Um, uh, IO-Link's gonna reduce your cost, otherwise this probably wouldn't be a conversation point, but besides that, what other advantages can we talk about? Yeah, obviously reducing cost is a major factor nowadays. Um, that's a key point. But there's some other factors that definitely come into play, um, making IO-Link more advantageous for use in your equipment. Installation and commissioning, um, it's all done through connectivity for the most part. Simple IP67 circular connectors, providing um, network communication and aux power. Um, so very easy to lay out and actually install the system. Also assembly and startup time is greatly reduced because everything is connectivity, um, but also furthermore, the diagnostics and troubleshooting that IO-Link lends itself to um, at a very simple level allows that uptime um, of commissioning um, you know, to really be appreciated. And all those diagnostics, that's obviously gonna lead into uh, Industry 4.0 where you know, people remotely can tie, you know, get information, data information, of what's the pulse of their equipment, what's actually happening on their equipment. So that's made, uh, IOLINK has made that possible and it's gonna be the ma major stepping stone, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, more and more companies and manufacturing wanna see the status at the device level to make sure um, whether it's productive mint, productive maintenance or reducing bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. um, they wanna make sure they're optimizing the equipment. So I know that means some devices are gonna become smarter, but I don't want to scare people because it not only talks to smart devices that would be IO-Link compatible, but it's also really designed for their current systems, which is maybe passive devices. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously with the growth of IO-Link, there's a lot of smart sensors and smart devices coming out that talk specifically IO-Link, um, but it's really geared to a lot of just standard digital IO products or sensors. products that are on the market, sensors, actuators that will interface directly without any brains. If you Perfect. Let's talk a little bit about devices then. Um, so here at the top of the screen, uh, we have uh, uh, the field buses that we're compatible with currently today. Uh, I think we would find agree that probably Ethernet IP and Profinet are probably the most popular. Yeah, all your major uh, categories are up there though, EtherCAT, um, CC link, device net, it, it's available for any industrial protocol, but yeah, definitely Ethernet IP and Profinet drive the market. And I think a majority of the, the basically we're talking about field devices out there for sensors and, and, um, and outputs. Uh, so most of it starts off with the IO component of this, which is that uh, box to the uh, right there. Um, also, I see you have a, a green device here. What do you call that? So that's uh, representing IP20 IO. So we not only have IP67, digital I.O. devices in the field, um, but we also can bring all that IP20 on board with digital I.O. as well. Um, and we also not only have discrete I.O. hubs, but also uh, analog IP67 I.O. hubs as well. So besides the passive, we talked about the less smart sensors. Now the, the smart sensors, what do you get out of the smart sensors to, you know, to make an advantage? So if we look at sensors themselves, uh, having I.O. link capability allows you to um, a program that sensor set points functionality directly from the HMI um, without necessarily a PC interface or changing your PLC logic. Uh, but also there's over a hundred different parameters that you can monitor and uh, check status on. For instance, um, if you're using a laser measurement sensor um, for position control, um, not only are you getting very, very finite um, information back from that laser distance sensor, but you're also getting um, tolerances back such as is the lens getting dirty wow. do I need to to do some preventative maintenance so I don't bring the line down um, what's ambient temperature what's temperature of the sensor all things that come into play during uh, your process so now you can monitor and control those um, and, and allow your line to be flexible and fluid to adjust to uh, peak performance that's excellent so indicators likewise and some of these indicators have gotten smarter so now we're able to change colors on the fly uh, for guys building machines that have various customer requirements, you can basically buy a blank uh, stack light, for instance, and then 
dictate the colors out of the PLC. Yeah, not only colors, but animation. So we can go into just, these are all RGB units now, and they can do just a multitude of colors, but also animation, flashing, staccato, uh, continuous um, rotation. and Yeah, just, just a variety of things. And what that allows it to do is display a lot of information quickly um, to, to the end user, to the customer. Uh, without having to read maybe a, a big um, HMI screen and dissect that information. They know what colors and what particular animation means what. It's a, it's a quick indication to that end user on, on what's going on. Well, IOLink has been very helpful in the process area too. So you're dealing with signals that would traditionally be analog. Uh, now we can convert those signals away from analog, which a lot of times have a susceptibility to some of the, you know, say electrical noise, for instance. And I've seen a lot of customers try to uh, minimize that effect. So by switching it to a, an IO-Link device now, we're able to get a digital value and it's a much more safe and secure uh, uh, signal to get back to the PLC. But besides that, uh, describe what we got in motion. So motion up to this point has typically been pneumatic motion or valve control. We're using a, a valve manifold um, communication module. Typically in the past, it's been, let's say, Ethernet or Profinet. Um, and now we can get those directly for IO-Link so we can control those directly from an IO-Link master. Um, but more and more we've seen in the last year, the last few months especially, is a strong push for development on electric motion. So whether that be IP20 or IP66 um, uh, frequency inverters or BFDs, oh, yeah. as well as uh, stepper control, servo motor control, position control, all these products are coming to the market at a rapid pace because of the benefits that IO-Link brings. Definitely, definitely. Um, we have safety as well. I can see that in the yellow uh, uh, IO block on the far right. I uh, want to explain that. Yeah, so there's actually another unique product there as well, but that yellow block indicates a safety block. Currently only available on ProfiSafe. So you need to be run, running a Siemens PLC, Siemens mm -hmm. Safety PLC for that matter, um, using the ProfiSafe protocol. And then that block would allow you to connect your light curtains, your e-stops, your uh, safety switches directly to that Profi safe IOLink enabled block and carry that information over IOLink. That's a very exciting uh, product development because now instead of having a dedicated um, network for your IO level uh, devices and a separate network for your safety devices, you can combine that all now on one simple network. Um, and again, right now only in Profi safe, but we're looking for some other exciting uh, uh, protocols to come out in the future. I agree. That'd be a huge cost savings. Well, let's, let's keep moving. Um, I want to get to the layout and I want to get to your calculator uh, for our viewers. So um, just to remind our viewers, if you had questions, there is that uh, question and answer button on the bottom. Feel free to ask questions. We'll get to those as soon as we can. Um, but as we move ahead, let's go ahead and do a layout. So uh, starting a layout, let's compare what we call conventionally a parallel system. Yeah, or like I said, we're going we're gonna to compare parallel network and IO link. Parallel is your traditional or lack of a better term, old school wiring, where we're going to use a, um, a centralized IO model and we'll hardwire everything direct, directly back to a common point, that being the PLC yes, in the panel. Main panel. Perfect. All right, so let's just go ahead and uh, make up a, a layout. Um, wanna, what do you want to start with? Well, let's just go a small to mid-sized machine. Let's say uh, 42 sensor inputs. Sensor inputs. Perfect. So um, to do that, let's maybe wire them to some field blocks. Yeah, I mean, even if you're using direct wiring, most people at least have migrated to an IP67 style quick disconnect IO block. So yeah, in this case, we need three eight port blocks, which are capable of two signals a piece, total of 48 input signals. We have 42. Yeah. So those three blocks suffice our needs. Perfect. And that leaves us with six spares. Um, what next? Uh, let's just do some outputs, whether it's actuators, uh, hydraulic valves, indicator lights, anything like that. So let's say, I don't know, um, 10. 10 on the field. Wire those to a, another I.O. block? Yeah, we can wire those to an I.O. block or those could wire directly back to the panel. But in this case, we'll, we'll take them to a, a standard output block, which allows us to bring, let's say in this case, those valves directly back. Perfect. Um, maybe add a couple of remote boxes? Yeah, I mean, on any piece of equipment, even if you have a main PLC, you're going to have some remote HMI boxes or human machine interface boxes where you're going to have maybe a, a stack light, a couple selector switches, push button along with your HMI, um, just because there's some functionality that needs to occur at that station. All right, let's add two of those. Um, and again, those are hardware directly back to the PLC. 
uh, analog? So analog, obviously, with processes becoming more rigidly controlled and, and um, traceability and quality being such a, a featured point of, of product, um, analog is becoming more popular. And in the typical parallel wiring um, example, we would take analog and hardware that directly back to the panel to a PLC so card. Like an analog input card, yeah. perhaps or output card. Um, so let's add one of those um, as well. And uh, for fun, want to do some RFID? Yeah, I mean, traceability is becoming more and more. In this case, let's say this is some interchangeable tooling. So we're just making sure the correct tooling card is in position for that machine. So yeah, let's put up like two RFID heads, tool A, right. tool B. Perfect. And, and that goes to a processor. The processor actually does the translation of the RFID read and write and sends that back, in this case, to our PLC via a serial connection. All right, just, and lastly, we just add some manifolds. Yep, valve manifolds, there's obviously motion on the machine, throw up two of those with, I don't know, let's say eight valves a piece. All right, perfect. So this would be a conventional layout, you would agree, like this is yep. showing all the wires passing back to the uh, terminal blocks. Um, uh, if for any of your outputs, what, would you wanna explain what we gotta do here? Yeah, so obviously inputs all hardware back to terminal blocks, then uh, hardware to swing arms back to the PLC cards. Uh, the larger blocks are, are just representing output production because now in any of our outputs, um, indicators, valves, things of that nature, we need to go to a circuit breaker or fuse to protect that output device. And again, we're adding sequential uh, input and output and analog cards in the PLC rack to make sure we have enough dedicated inputs, outputs on our PLC itself. And you can see it, as you add more inputs, we're gonna need more input cards as yeah. more outputs. In terms of flexibility, if we need to add anything to the system and we maximize it here, we need to make sure we accommodate the panel space for additional terminal blocks, outputs, swing arms. We need to make sure our PLC can handle more input or output cards because if something needs to be added in the field or later on in the design, right now our flexibility is very limited to what hardware is out there. We added these blue dots here uh, to the slide, but these blue dots represent the basically the six total input spares that are off this block and the six total inputs uh, or outputs on this block. So generally speaking, you have only six inputs or outputs based on this uh, system before you got to add another IO card or another Correct. block. Right now you're maxed out. Maxed yep. out. So it's a lot of rewiring if you had to make a change. Absolutely. So perfect. Let's do a, a network layout. Okay. So um, let's look at the same thing via network. Obviously the network model is most common now as technology has changed. Um, and you'll see quickly pictorially what the advantages are of the network solution. All right, perfect. So we'll go back to those same 42 yep. inputs. Yep. Uh, those will be through some uh, field IO blocks. Yeah, typically a 16 IO configurable block. So in this case we put three, let's just for sake of argument, say they're ethernet IP blocks. Okay. 16 IO configurable. So obviously, that gives us a total of 48 inputs. We're only using 42, six spares left over. Perfect, and then we'll add the same for the outputs. Yep, still have an output block, so we're gonna uh, more than likely have that dedicated because we can run a separate aux power run to it, um, and that'll handle 16 outputs. And that covers our needs. For our two HMI boxes, uh, we'll network connect those. Those have a little bit difference of uh, convention. They're not just an IO block. Yeah, what we're showing um, for our inputs and outputs in the field is an IP67 quick M12 connector device. Um, typically those HMI boxes, if they're brought on the network, um, they're using a remote IO style system mm -hmm. where you have a communication bus head yep. and then you'll have slice and block IO elements that snap to that um, for the various inputs, outputs, analog signals. But with doing that, just like any ethernet device in this case we put out there, we're adding costs. Because every time we need to establish communication back to the PLC mm -hmm. via our network media, that means it's ethernet communication. So all of those devices, we're paying for an ethernet IP chip, chip set, which raises the cost of our hardware. Um, analog is, I know we got a lot of customers that wanna do analog over these IP67, which there's some products out there, obviously you can buy them, they're very expensive, but most often I do see people wire those ultimately back to the panel. So we'll add that analog back and maybe wire it back to the uh, IO card. Yeah, I mean, we can go IP67 and I'll touch on that in just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I still see people, like you said, taking analog hardware and back to the PLC rack. Um, we have the RFID in this case. Yep. Um, still gonna need a processor um, because what that, the RFID data is taken on a subnetwork, essentially taken to that processor. That processor can sit to data that can be read at the ethernet IP protocol or ProfiNet protocol. So 
yeah, still need a processor and two heads. And then our two manifolds go out there and they use a valve, um, a valve manifold communication module for Ethernet IP. So you can see in this model, we've cleaned things up a bit because we have very few connections back to the panel. Yeah. We can decentralize now and put our hardware components where we need them in the field, mm -hmm. meaning um, we're not as limited in flexibility of where we can mount these and then having to be concerned to hardware them all the way back to a main panel. We can be very flexible because we're using connectivity now between point A and point B. And definitely you can see that and to add this just, just by switching from your parallel to network, if you needed to add more IO, you would have to add another one of these. IO Absolutely, blocks. you know, valve manifolds, et cetera. The only thing to be um, mindful of in the network example here, um, each one of those devices, whether it be a configurable I.O. block, an RFID processor, an HMI remote I.O. rack, those are all consuming an IP address, which is the identity of that device. PLCs are typically limited based on the number of IP addresses they can handle. So in terms of addition or flexibility in the network model, we just need to make sure if we're going to add other devices that our PLC has the availability of accepting more IP addresses. If not, we have to look at upgrading the PLC. Oh, that's excellent. So uh, I think at this point, we'd probably be smart to do some cost comparisons between those two. Sure. So let's use your calculator. You've made this calculator here on, um, on Excel and essentially we populated our IL. Uh, we gave us 42 inputs, 10 outputs. Um, in this case, uh, we put basically eight in and eight out um, for your two HMIs. Yeah, so four in and four out at each station. And then we're gonna add that one analog. Uh, we put uh, two manifolds out there with eight valves each. Yep. Okay, and then uh, we added the two RFIDs. Yep, so what this calculator allows you to do is put in those basic IO requirements, and now it's gonna start populating fields. Not so much on the parallel side, but you'll see on the network and the IO link it does. Now we've gotta actually just go in, and we're strictly doing a hardware analysis at this point. We gotta put in some real world costs. Obviously, we know that's going to vary from customer to customer and uh, region to region. We're just going to go with what you'd find as an MSRP cost. Oh, perfect. Just for analysis. Now, and again, I've, you know, I've seen some of these comparisons you've done, and uh, some of the savings we've seen is, is uh, astonishing. So, perfect. So, let's go ahead and do this. Um, I'm in the field of 16 point input, eight port, uh, the uh, IO blocks yeah. here for inputs. So, we had 42 total IP67 inputs. So obviously we need three of the 16 input blocks to cover that. Okay. And um, we're going to say probably an average cost with that being a 16 point input block with a quick disconnect home run cord on mm -hmm. there, maybe an M23 um, 19 pin home run cord of about $250. All right, perfect. I'll put that in. So the eight output block we're not going to use. So we're going to zero out the cost on that. Okay. We can handle our 10 IP67 outputs with one 16 output block. Same price? Yeah, same price roughly. RFID processor, we need that processor to be serial to communicate directly back to the PLC. Um, MSRP on that is $2,500. Wow, okay. That processor can only support two heads, which in this case is lucky for us because we only have two RFID points. Yep. And each one of those antennas is, uh, is about $1,500. Wow, that adds up quick. And then um, each of those valve stacks has like a 25 pin D shell commonly. Yeah, just or at least so you hardware. can hardwire di through digital IO and relatively inexpensive, $50. Okay. And how much labor do you put on for hardwiring all big, this? This is going to vary from, from integrator to integrator, but big costs associated with the parallel example is labor. So let's be fair and say this is going to take a guy eight hours a day, five days a week, one full week to complete it. 40 hours. Okay. 40 hours at, at fifty dollars an hour perfect and that's just because there is so much labor with pulling those wires back and then and then terminating each individual wire back in the panel that's perfect um i know what's going to happen we're going to show this presentation that everyone's going to comment that the costs may not be right on for them so when you're watching this and you're seeing this and having questions on this is, you know reach out to your barham sales guy we can review this calculator with you and go through these numbers the way you perceive them yeah work with your own numbers and i i'm fairly very confident that you're, you'll be pleased. Yeah. Sure. So one thing we definitely have to take into account with the parallel wired example is the PLC hardware cost portion of it, because that's a big portion of this. 
Um, we'll negate the PLC. We'll assume we're using the same PLC for every network. Okay. But we do have 16 point PLC input cards. We do need four of them because we need them to not only take care of the IP67 inputs, but the IP20 inputs in the HMI. So we need four of those. Yep. And we'll say those are about $250 per card for PLC card. All right, perfect. Again, the output PLC card, we need, um, if we're using a 16 point, we need three of them or five if we're using an eight point. We'll use the 16 point mm -hmm. um, and we'll say the market cost is $250 for those. All right, perfect. Zero out the cost of the eight point. Um, we do have an analog, so we are gonna use an analog card. Uh, not an inexpensive piece of hardware for a PLC, right John? Oh, they're very expensive. That's the number one thing is, hey, how do we get rid of that card? Yeah, so right there to do to handle two analog signals, we're looking at $650. 600. So we zero out that four point. Uh, again, no network card, for the RFID processor, it's if we were trying to run it on another network, but we're doing serial. Okay. So you can zero that out. A swing arm. Swing arm, for those of you that aren't familiar, are a way to easily terminate or to terminate more easily those hard home run cables coming into the panel um, would terminate on a, uh, on a terminal block base with a D sub connection directly to the PLC card. It just saves a little bit of labor. A lot of labor, yeah. So we need eight swing arms to take care of all of our I.O. cards in the PLC. Um, and we'll say those are roughly about $175 a piece. Definitely. Then our calculator does a quick calculation for all the individual terminal block terminations. Mm -hmm. We figure right around 194 plus or minus 10%. Okay. We'll just say a dollar terminal block to be safe. Yeah. And then because of our output devices, we have 52 devices. We'll say $20 a point either for a fuse and fuse block or circuit breaker. Oh, perfect. And then again, soft savings, we can talk about this later, estimated savings on panel size reduction. There's definitely benefits there, but just from a hardware perspective, we look that this system, just from hardware, is gonna take you $13,634. Yep, with labor, right? So let's take a look at the network. All right, perfect. That's a lot of money, by the way, which you normally would see a system like that, and you wouldn't imagine it costing so much. Um, so on the network, we still got the same number of inputs, obviously the left. Yeah. So this is where it went and did some auto calculation for us, which, which is very nice. So traditionally we're not going to use an input only block. So zero that out. Okay. We're going to put all our field devices, our IP 67 devices in a configurable IO block. In okay. In this case, Ethan IP. So we have 42 plus 10 of the outputs, 52. So we're going to need four 16 IO configurable blocks. Um, and we'll say an Ethernet IP block nowadays, um, around $400. Okay. Again, no output blocks. That's taking care of the configurable block. So here's our IP20 COM module that needs to go into the HMI boxes, what we'll just call remote I.O. Sure. Um, and again, that bus head is relatively expensive and it needs to reside anywhere IP20 devices need to be brought into the network. We'll say that COM module is $600. Yep, I've seen that. And then we'll say respectively eight point in um, input and output modules are about $250 a piece. All right, perfect. Then an analog, yeah, with our network products, you do have more opportunities to do IP67 devices, but we'll keep this, uh, again, hardware back to the PLC. So we'll zero out our IP67 costs. Okay. Go to a two point analog card, which again, we said is $650. Zero out our four port card. Again, we need a processor, same cost, $2,500. Read write head, same cost, $1,500. Now our network valve interfaces, since it's not a discrete IO, like in a parallel wiring, it does have an ethernet chip set on there to make it intelligent. Um, those are in the neighborhood of um, $350. Right, okay, that makes sense. So we have a field hardware uh, total of $10,650. It's a little bit less uh, overall than the uh, uh, parallel wired. Um, but here you'd have a huge labor savings. You'd have a huge panel savings because you wouldn't have all the terminal blocks. You'd have a huge labor savings because everything's connectivity in the field. Basically, circular connector, screw it in. And I see your total IP addresses. Uh, how did you tally that? So everything out there that's an ethernet enabled device, that being an IO block, uh, RFID processor, uh, the remote I.O. and the HMI boxes, the valve communication modules, all those have an Ethernet IP chip in them, so they need an IP address to communicate directly with the PLC. So we have 16 devices out there that consume an IP address. Perfect. 
let's go back to um, our layouts um, and do an IO link uh, comparison. First of all, here's our cost as it was for parallel wiring. And here's our cost for our network wiring as it lays out. Um, so how do we do the IO link? So IO link, um, again, we're gonna keep the same network requirements. So if you start dropping it in there, John. Yep, so what's so, the main component of IO link? Yeah, so here's where the model is gonna change. We are gonna use uh, um, what you see in this picture called a master block. Mm -hmm. What a master block does is communicate directly on your upper level protocol, your ethernet IP, your Profinet. So we do pay for a chipset there that communicates directly back to the PLC, has an IP address, but you'll see on this particular model, there's eight ports. Those ports are IO link ports. Mm -hmm. to, so to those ports, I can connect IO hubs, as we discussed, either IP20 or IP67, discrete or analog IP20 hubs, or I'm sorry, IO hubs. Mm -hmm. I can connect RFID directly to the master block. I do not need a processor. We'll touch base more on that, but I can uh, hardwire an IO link enabled read write head directly to the master block. I can wire directly to valves that have an IO link um, communication um, mm -hmm. module. Um, I can connect directly to IO link enabled devices that we spoke about, yep. such as sensors, indicators, indicators, motion. Mm -hmm. um, so with this, we, we, you talked about having uh, several devices. We're probably going to exceed the eight on here. So let's add another IO-Link master. Yeah, and you'll see how that plays out. So now we have our two IO-Link masters consuming two IP addresses. Now we can start connecting these IO-Link devices, which are transparent to the PLC, and the PLC will see it as your upper-level network. All right, so, so we'll add some inputs. Again, these are 16 IO configurable blocks. So okay. we're adding three of them. So we have a total of 48 inputs. Um, leaving obviously two on each block free. So we have six additional inputs or IO since they're configurable, we can add there. Per block and then we have additionally. Um, yeah, add another configurable block to handle our outputs. And then we have six available IO there. So the HMI boxes are a little different. HMI boxes, this is a nice feature as if you remember in network, we had to go to a remote IO bus head, if you will, and then slice and block IO next to that. That bus head cost was six six hundred fifty dollars. I think we said, John, which Correct. is a, a fair market price. So here, what we're doing is we're actually taking an IP twenty um, discrete I/O hub, mounting it in the HMI box, and then using an M twelve connector going right to a master block. So we eliminated that bus head communication device altogether, and you'll see the cost is, is tremendous, and you'll see that when we run the calculations. But now these are directly on the IO link network, um, handling the IO. We also process analog as well? Yeah, so here's a, here's a neat way. Um, we said in networks, IP67 devices were available for analog, but they're pricey. Um, so Balif designed a eight port analog master um, that communicates over an, to an IO link master, consuming one port on that master, and that gives you eight ports of 16-bit resolution analog feedback. Um, current, voltage, temperature, various, various Seems. models. So now instead of hardwiring all the way back to your panel, being concerned of mounting considerations, using shielded cables, noise, we can put this again, decentralized to where we want it next to our analog IO, use a standard shielded prox cord and, and we're good to go. And that'll really simplify uh, a system. And in addition to that, if you add more signals to this, you still got set, you know seven more ports or seven more devices. Yeah, we set an analog card, a two-point analog card in a PLC was $650. Oh, yeah. You'll see this Balif analog block is somewhere in the neighborhood of $350, wow. giving you eight points. That's so quite a bit for flexibility. Huge savings. Um, RFID, for instance. So we have RFID that we add, and, and I, I had these uh, blocks kind of uh, wiggle a little bit just to show that uh, each of these blocks actually have an identifier. Why don't you explain that? Yeah, so there's actually a, um, an allotment of information that can reside on each block um, that could, you could think of it as using it as tool ID. That block has its own identity. So um, let's say those hubs were interchangeable on, on tooling. When that tooling comes and gets connected, that master block is looking for, I'm looking for my IO block A. And that IO block, for 
layman's terms is gonna report back, hey, this is IO block A or B, so that you can make sure you have the right device hooked up. So you can eliminate the need for either BCD identification or RFID in a very inexpensive way. Tags and readers. So th these readers are now attached um, directly to the master. Eliminated the processor altogether. Eliminated that $2,500 processor that can only handle two heads. Here, if we wanted to, we could connect eight RFID to one master. Read write heads directly to one master. Fantastic. And so uh, our manifolds, again, those are now connected to IO Link masters as well. Yes, correct. So let's do a cost analysis. All right, back to the calculator. So again, same, same IO um, requirements, uh, nothing changed. Here's where it did a little bit of calculation for us. If you take a look at the left, okay. um, now it's, it's figuring out how many master link ports I need. As I said, the master is gonna communicate to your upper level network. There's four port masters and eight port masters. Um, so for our IP67 devices, we need at least three IO link ports, one for um, your outputs, um, two for your HMI stations, uh, one for your analog device, two for your valve manifolds, and two for your RFID points. It means we need 11 master ports. Perfect. So it, it's done the calculation and said, based on an eight port IO link master, I need two of those. And for a cost, we'll put uh, $600. Okay. So now that's our only IO link enabled device per se. Now we're gonna go to IO link hardware that connect to that master. Um, and when I say, uh, IO link device, I mean one that is uh, able to communicate with that upper level. That's right. Network. The rest will be dedicated IO. Perfect. So we go to a 16 IO configurable block. Mm -hmm. So to handle the inputs and outputs, we need a total of four of those. And um, we'll say those are $200. All right. Um, so our IP20, that's essentially replacing the bus head model and your HMI boxes. So you need two of those. Here's where the beauty comes in. Those are $150 a piece. Oh, wow. And that gives you 16 IO, configurable IO. Eliminate $650 for the bus head, $250 for each card. So quite a savings. That's a huge right savings. Um, and also analog. We're gonna put our IP67 block out there. Even though we're only using one of those ports, we have seven available on that IP67 block. We're at $350. That's amazing. It was $650 for a two port analog card. Yeah. So you imagine as soon as you start having a couple analog, points, you know, using IO link can save you quite a bit of money. Um, RFID, here's a huge savings as well, because we eliminate the need for that processor and the IO link read write antennas um, aren't quite as um, complicated as the upper level stuff. So it's cheaper to manufacture. So all we need to account for is two RFID read write heads at $450 a piece. All right. So essentially we do two RFID points at $900 versus $3,500. I'm gonna put that even more just because I think it makes makes this number even look more attractive. That's fine. So um, I've seen them around 600 bucks, 450 bucks could be reasonable too. Yep. And then of course we have our valves. Um, we still need to have a valve communication module because we do have to have some intelligence to talk to that IO link master. Yep. Um, but it comes at a lower cost because it's not an ethernet chipset. So somewhere in the neighborhood of about 205 bucks I'd say. I think around 200, yeah, I've seen that. Well, perfect. Now look at this uh, hardware cost. Um, it almost doesn't even seem right, but uh, 4260 bucks. if we were, as we would compare it back to our network as well, um, 10650 it's considerable savings. So your calculator has done some math against that. Yeah, you can see against hardware, um, it's a $9,000 savings or 68%. Wow. And um, using network, it's $6,400 roughly or 60%. But there's some major intangibles here we're not talking about. Um, let's talk about first that with IO-Link, you're going to use standard media. Mm -hmm. So in between your masters, you're still going to use network media, in this case, an Ethernet IP port. But that's only from the panel to each master. You can see all the devices coming off the master mm -hmm. are using standard media. When I say standard media, I mean a regular four pin or five pin tool cord based on the device you're connecting to. So typically those are anywhere from 40 to 50% less than the network cable. So we're using readily available prox cords off the shelf to do our communication and only keeping network media at the upper level of the masters. Also aux power. You see we daisy chain aux power from master to master. But John, if you take a look back at the network mm -hmm. graphic. Mm -hmm. 
notice how most of these devices, we have to daisy chain aux power to each device. Oh yeah. Um, with the advent of electronics today, most of those devices are very low current consumption. So it doesn't need the eight amps coming out on that seven eighths mini connector. But here we have to daisy chain that to keep the integrity of our, our power drop. So that gets very, very expensive. In the IO link model, we're basically just connecting our aux power to our, um, to our masters. So there's a great reduction in standard in media costs, both network and aux power. But then if you can go back to the, um, the math analysis, oh, yeah. you'll see the number of IP addresses. Um, remember we talked about IP addresses. So an IP address is the, identif the uh, identity of the module that's out there. We reduced it from 16 total to two. Now what that means is the amount of traffic on your network and traffic needs to men be maintained mm -hmm. to make sure you don't have devices dropping on and offline communication wise. So that's a huge savings, um, one with not only the hardware you can select to use in your panel, um, but two, um, commissioning mm -hmm. and troubleshooting in the field. When you don't have all that information smashing into each other, uh, it can make for a much cleaner working network. One thing I may want to add to back on the slide is, is now these devices, uh, if you imagine this being on the back bone of your equipment, so I'm having the master back there connected to your PLC, you could actually get these devices, uh, like the hubs and valve stacks, much closer. Yeah, decentralized to exactly where you want them. Yeah. Let's talk about flexibility as well. You see we highlighted the, the blue ports of what's available. Can you go to the math slide? Absolutely. So just for fun, as you can see, we used 11 IO-Link master ports. We used two masters mm -hmm. for a total of 16 ports. That gives us five additional IO-Link ports that are not master ports not being used. Mm -hmm. So in the field or a customer comes to you and says they want to add more IO, more traceability, really kind of a minimal issue. Because you can see, at least in our application here, if we wanted to, without buying additional masters, adding IP addresses or anything on our system, we could add five additional valve manifolds, up to 40 analog signals, five RFID points, or 150 additional IO points. And again, that's just with buying a simple configurable IO block or a COM, IO link COM module for a valve manifold, but not having to add more network devices, more IP addresses. But on the contrary of that, it also gives you ultimate flexibility because if a customer comes to you and says, I want to order, I want to add 160 IO points to this machine, five more RFID processors, 10 more analog signals. You can now say, okay, I'm going to have to buy some hardware in the field. I'm going to have to buy a couple extra masters, add a couple IP addresses to add this mass change. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Nothing in my panel changes. PLC doesn't have to change. Switch doesn't have to change. Uh, nothing in your panel side is really going to have to change. We're simply going to connect, plug and play to another master, drop to eight more devices off of that. We need more, drop to another master. It's very simple, done with standard media, easy to expand and, and add in the field as well. One thing too it, that might um, add on to what you just said, but as you add more IO to your network and your layout, your cost um, savings is going to increase. Absolutely. So this is gonna get even bigger and better the bigger your system starts to lay out. And remember too, with flexibility or addition, the only limitation we're going to have per se in an IO link model most of the time is limitation of the hardware. My PLC can only handle so many IP addresses. So why the IO link system can handle it, maybe your PLC can't and you have to go to a bigger model. But in terms of flexibility at the field level, IO links there. It's just waiting for something else to be plugged in. That's awesome. Um, one last thing, and we'll go on to some of our manufacturers that we support, but um, just keep this in mind too, uh, our IO-Link master doesn't always have to just talk to an IO-Link device, isn't that true? Correct. There is, um, you can use the ports on the IO-Link master for regular digital IO. So if you have a case where you want to maximize the use of your master and you only want to connect a couple IO-Link enabled devices, a couple hubs, but you have some, uh, some a couple IO points in close proximity to that master, we can plug them right into the IO-Link enabled ports and have them read just a simple discrete IO as well. That's perfect. Um, 
if you guys, uh, if our viewers are looking at these uh, screens or looking at the calculator again, if you want us to review this specifically with your layout, uh, we'd be glad to do that. Just make sure you reach out to yourself. I just want to repeat that again. Yeah, before we finish up, I, I do want to share that as well. And all the analysis I've done, large OEMs, small OEMs, um, sophisticated end users, uh, less sophisticated end users, we've seen the cost savings just from hardware 30 to 50 percent easily. Mm -hmm. Then you take the software commissioning, install time, design time, um, the fact that you can standardize on, on said panel and, and kind of add in the field as you need to go. The savings are, are, are tremendous. Yeah, almost too, too, uh, too much savings to ignore, truthfully. Um, so on the products for, for eight to here's our uh, hardware total. Um, HH Barnum, we've been selling IO-Link for several years. Uh, most of our sales guys are very well trained with this product, but in addition to that, we got an amazing applications and tech team to support you guys. Um, some of the manufacturers that, of course, Barnum carries are shown here. Lumberg um, sells IO-Link Masters, IO-Link Hubs. Um, how would you describe Balif? Balif probably uh, has the largest, not probably, they do have the largest breadth of product in the market. Like you said, it's open architecture. So there's a lot of manufacturers that build product, but Balif by far has the largest breadth of product. That being its complete offering with all the protocols and different form factors, IP67 master blocks, IP67 and IP20 IO hubs, both discrete and analog, um, the SART sensors and linear transducers, um, RFID, uh, power supplies that are IO link enabled to monitor status demand on those, um, stack lights and lighting products, and as well as the safety um, block we spoke about over propane safe. Perfect, and SMC, of course, that product, um, you might, or obviously valve stacks we put under the slide, but um, proportional regulators, things that would be uh, electronically controlling your pressure. Um, now, even stepper motors, also some uh, linear uh, transducers with respects to the cylinder switches, um, gap checkers as well. And, and all these manufacturers are adding products almost on a daily basis. White Mueller, same thing. Um, they have a nice IP20 uh, solution for IO-Link uh, as well as power supplies. Banner, huge um, R&D putting that they're putting forth in their products in terms of not only IO-Link enabled photoelectric sensors, um, but lighting as we spoke about. Having a light be multi-segmented, a very variety of colors and animations, it can, it can translate and, and just uh, show so many factors of what's going on in the production environment. That's a huge, huge market for them is that smart lighting, if you will. I've seen the customers that use that light uh, makes their equipment stand apart, stand in front of the other equipment we use in standard Absolutely. light. Absolutely, sure. it's cutting edge. And, and same with indication, and touch buttons and, and user interfaces of that nature. So lastly, to touch on Lenza. Lenza is one of our uh, lines for, for motion, for variable frequency drive servos as well. Uh, explain what we have coming out here. So typically to this point, most people have either been using an IP66 enabled uh, Ethernet or Profinet enabled drive in the field or an IP20 VFD in the panel. Each has its pros and cons. The IP66 version, you obviously can do decentralized, um, but it's not very cost effective. It's a nice product, but very expensive. Now when you use IP20 VFDs or motion control, you have everything mounted in the panel. So you're doing a lot of dedicated drops out to your motors, mm -hmm. which increases cost, labor, complexity, but not only that, heat and size of your panel. Huge factors. Let's minimize that panel. Let's get as much uh, AC or climate control off that panel as we can, just one less thing we have to worry about. So now with Lenz's offering, they have a great IP65 drive at a a very nice price point that you can go and decentralize, control your motors, and not only start, stop, forward, reverse, monitor faults, see 100 parameters of what's going on with um, current torque, uh, anything that's going on with that VFD. Um, so that really is going to change the game because now we're going to be able to put VFDs, say, along the conveyor, decentralize where they need to go, plug and play, network or IO link. Um, connection via a standard prox cord mm -hmm. and, and you're doing all your motion control. That makes uh, obviously uh, the, the system more modular too. So if you're uh, building the machine, you need to tear down the machine, just basically unplugging from an IO block uh, should really simplify your system. Absolutely. So perfect. Well, uh, that's it for, that I have as far as slides go. Uh, for all our viewers and listeners to our webinar, we want to thank you again for tuning in.
Um, and we're going to turn this back to Cody to answer some of your questions. Great stuff. John, uh, Zach, thank you for, for sharing your insight today. Uh, we did get some feedback that some of the slides were a bit blurry for some of the customers on the, the webinar. Um, we're going to pull up some of those summary slides right now uh, as we take a, a couple questions so that everyone can see them. We'll also send a copy of the slides out to everyone who attended. Um, we'll be post that on-demand recording on the Barnum website. Um, let's get started with uh, the first question. How does IOLINK communicate with my PLC? Uh, that gets a little more complex. Obviously, the IOLINK um, is working integral as an extension of your upper level network protocol, Ethernet IP, for example. Um, and there's a lot of software, AYs written, um, a lot of program functionality that Balif and Banner or Banner and Barnum have created to make that that simpler. Wouldn't you say, John? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question. Hopefully, if the viewers are still tuning in, that question I think is going to be best handled. We're going to try to do another webinar, uh, perhaps that might actually show how a block and how you can figure an IO block and help you get over that fear. Is this going to make add complexity to our systems or not? So we can get, actually show you how this IO that's in the field gets all the way put into your PLC so you can add a program to it. Yeah, and Barnum, our application engineers, along with our partners, Balif, Banner, and all the other manufacturers, have really gone to great lengths to make it very simple to implement these devices into your network. And we have write-ups, uh, videos, walkthroughs, and, and people that are always able to, to be online with you virtually um, to minimize any complications in that process. Pretty simple. Right on. Hey, um, one question we got from a couple of our viewers is, what are the length um, is there any length restrictions to run IOLINK? And that, I'm assuming that's the question from your IOLINK master to say a hub or to an IOLINK device. Yeah, because your master, your upper level network is still gonna need to conform to um, the recommendations from that manufacturer, Ethernet IP not exceeding 100 meters, let's say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when it comes down to your block and hub, John, I know there's the different distances based on if it's an IOLINK hub or an RFID point. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, so mainly the, the um, uh, rule is, is you have 20 meters of distance. That's that yellow tool cord that goes from your IOLINK master to like say an IO hub or to a, uh, a laser sensor that's IOLINK compatible for instance. Um, so 20 meters or 60 feet roughly if you did the conversion. And that can be an unshielded standard prox cord. Um, the only time we really recommend the um, using a shielded prox cord is um, with use of RFID read write heads. That's right. Due to noise. Uh, one more question that rolled in here. Hopefully that answered the uh, question of the viewer is uh, for daisy chaining. So there's some unique things that Balf does, and this really um, offers a very competitive advantage. Um, describe what the daisy chain. Yes. Yeah, so we wanted to keep it simple and really take a conservative. Um, fiscal approach to our um, analysis here. But you're right, Balif does have products um, that are firmware Rev 1.1 that allow you to daisy chain off of certain hubs. And what that means is you can take a standard IOLINK um, configurable hub that's plugged into a master, use the last port of that hub to daisy chain now to another 16 IO configurable block or to a valve manifold kind of a term that I've dubbed double density. Mm -hmm. So you're essentially getting double density of IO off that one master port. So now in the past and with a lot of our competitors, uh, to Balif for instance, eight master ports would equate to 16 IO points per port. Um, well, in this case, since we can double that up, um, we get a 16 input block first, mm -hmm. we use the last port, so we lose two IO points, daisy chain to another 16 IO block, so we can actually get 30 IO points off of one single master point. That's right. So yeah, that's a little more uh, advanced, but very easy to do, very simple. And Balif has plenty of products out there that have this capability. And, and with our example that we show there, if we would have done that, we could have perhaps even got this down to one master block, if you so decide. And then your savings would have been even greater. So absolutely. What other questions? That you might have. Do we, we want to try and go through those summary slides maybe real quick? Well, as you can see, this slide, I'm, I'm, and again, we apologize for it being blurry, a little technical difficulty, but as, you, as we go through the summary, the very bottom, we have the savings analysis and the very bottom. Basically, we've um, calculated that for the total hardware savings versus a parallel network, we found that it was $9,374, or in this case, 
nearly 69% um, hardware savings when you compare that hardware and, and uh, labor cost. And even for network wiring, based on our uh, configuration that we did here, we found it to be about a 60% savings. So those are remarkable savings. Yeah, for sure. And, and we can't, we see there's a lot of other questions here we'd love to address. Um, we'll try to reach out and answer those. Again, we're just trying to scratch the surface here. Um, there's a lot more detail and a lot more technical data we can get involved in um, with you. So we do appreciate the time and I'll hand it back over to Cody. Yeah, great questions, great content. Uh, thank you both again. Um, as everyone's probably guessed here at Barnum, we are true believers in the value that IOLINK can bring to the table for our customers. Uh, HH Barnum and our suppliers, we were early adopters in IOLINK and our customers have reaped real cost savings from our early and continued investments in this technology. Barnum customers who convert to IOLINK, and you can save hundreds of hours in time and hassle and save thousands of dollars in fixed and variable cost. It's really um, you know, pretty impressive. And you know, really, with the most powerful and comprehensive collection of IOLINK products on the market today, HH Barnum is the leader in the field. And we are best positioned to help you and your team capitalize on everything that IOLINK has to offer. Uh, so the question is, how do you get started? Well, the first step is to give your Barnum salesman a call ask to set up a custom review of your machine layout to see if IOLINK makes sense for you. Uh, your Barnum salesman can bring in John or Zach or any of our Barnum IOLINK specialists. They'll plug in your numbers and calculate your savings. Uh, this short cost savings calculation process, it's simple, it's easy, just like, just like IOLINK. So give your Barnum salesman a call and ask to schedule your Barnum IOLINK calculation today. We thank everyone again for attending this webinar and for your continued support of HH Barnum and our suppliers. Uh, stay tuned for more Barnum webinar topics in the coming weeks. In the meantime, be well and stay safe.